Um, we might want to wait a couple of minutes for people to, to get yep. on the call. Because it takes about five minutes. Lowers. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Oh, I'm giving a summary. All right, then. <laughs> Good to know. I should prepare summarizing. Ready. So we have Michael and Mike from Couchbase. Do you go by Michael, Michael? Is that how you guys differentiate? <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, I think so. I'm the Michael and Mike is Mike. <laughs> All right, that makes it easier. Oh, you're, you're muted, Chris. There are actually two more from Couchbase on the core. Not the oh, same. great. Yeah. Sweet. Thank you, whoever is managing the attendees. Let's see, 835 right on the money. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right, that looks like a good quorum of people. Hello everyone, welcome to Friday. Welcome to the OTSC call. Great to see all your lovely faces. Um, we have a pretty cool call today. Um, we've got the Couchbase team here in force, and Mike and Michael are going to present uh, the great work they've been doing integrating open tracing uh, directly into their libraries and products. Um, please uh, make sure you add yourself to the attending list. Looks like everyone's doing a good job of that right now. Um, and yes, uh, Matt, we are recording this. Um, so this will go up on YouTube on the Open Tracing channel when we're done. And on that note, uh, Michael, you want to take it away? Yes. Uh, can you hand me the baton? Uh, all right. I think I can just share my screen. Can everyone see? Yeah. Uh, okay. Perfect. So let me jump over to the slides here. All right, so um, thanks everyone for uh, joining and everyone who is watching the recording in the future. <laughs> um, a slight correction, so I'll be presenting this alone. Mike had his hands full with other stuff, so, um, but, but he, he's around for any .NET and other related questions, but you'll just have to 
bear with me for now. <laughs> so yeah, my name is Michael Nitschinger. I work for Couchbase as a software engineer. And lately, uh, the last couple of months, amongst other things, I've um, been uh, knee deep into um, what we call response time observability, which of course also feeds into the whole open tracing theme, which I'll uh, talk uh, in the next couple of minutes. Um, and then uh, we have a demo and uh, yeah, then I think we can just easily open it up for questions. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Couchbase, just a couple of slides for those who haven't heard it before, what we've been doing. Then the challenge which brought us into the whole uh, open tracing, distributed tracing theme, timeouts. Then what we've done with adopting open tracing, the good and the challenging pieces. Then a, a live demo. And then a call to action and then we can uh, do some questions. All right, so what is Couchbase for those who haven't heard it before? Uh, basically, Couchbase is a, a distributed document or a database focused on scalability and performance, right? So that's the, the one line sentence of what Couchbase does. And so it, it has all kinds of properties like auto sharding, a flexible data model. But for I think for the purpose of, of today's core, what, what's important is that it has a memory first architecture and everything inside the database itself um, is also done asynchronously. Right, and we'll see how that works in a second. And the other thing is that you can scale workloads independently. And if, if you look at Couchbase from where it's coming from, right, originally years, years ago, um, it basically was a distributed managed cache and a key value store. And then it evolved into the document database theme. And it has been adding other things like Couchbase Mobile and Nickel Query Language, which is very SQL like. We added full text search, now we're adding analytics. So you can see there are like more and more components being added to the system, which you can immediately think that it's probably not going to make it easier to troubleshoot uh, performance issues, right? So, but, but just that you get an idea, this is where we're coming from, basically from being a distributed managed cache and then adding functionality towards document-oriented analytics, full text search, and so forth. And uh, one, one thing to, to call out here is that uh, one interesting property of Couchbase is that it supports what we call multi-dimensional multi scaling. So you can basically enable every kind of service, be it a key value, be it full text search, querying on, on every node in the cluster, but you can also choose to only um, enable individual services uh, on each node, right? So you can say, okay, I have a 50 node cluster, on two nodes I run the query service, on the others I do indexing, and then I have a couple other nodes where I store the data, right, the KV service. Um, and the, the important piece here is that on the client side, our SDKs are actually like intelligent, right? They don't just take your data dump and send it to a remote socket, which happens mostly with relation databases, but the SDKs play an integral role as part of the distributed system. So they basically get cluster information in your real time, um, basically get an up-to-date, get an update of the topology. And then they decide when a request comes in where to dispatch it to including um, handling certain retry scenarios when um, you are rebalancing the cluster. And rebalancing means you can add and remove nodes on the fly without downtime. So that's another challenge that the SDKs handle, right? Making sure the data gets to the right places at every point in time uh, without user disruption, right? <laughs> and here's an example of, of how we would do write operations. So for example, you create a document in your, let's say, Java application. And then you call the upset method on the SDK. What happens is, of course, we send it over the wire to the server. And then it lands in the managed cache, our KV layer. And then the managed cache, once it's there, it will basically acknowledge the write uh, to the application itself. Um, and then it will asynchronously send uh, the operation to the replication queue, asynchronously to the disk queue, asynchronously to uh, the secondary indexing engine, right? So all of these steps are happening asynchronously. And obviously they can also happen uh, over the cluster, right? So the replication queue will eventually send the operations to the replicas on other machines, right? So um, even if you just perform a single operation from, from an SDK point of view, many different spots in the distributed system actually affected. And when we come to uh, the, the point where something's slow, right? Uh, we need to figure out which uh, places in the distributed system have been touched and where the slowness comes from. And the other operations are, are the same, but I, I just didn't add um, more slides since it's, it's uh, similar. But if you have questions on specific functionality of Couchbase, just let me know and we can uh, cover that later. 
So <laughs> with, with that um, basic knowledge in mind of how Couchbiz works and operates, uh, why, so what, what, what's the big challenge, right? And, and, and the, the thing we've come across uh, in the years, and, and I've been with Couchbiz for many years now, and, and we've been handling uh, support escalations, and one of the, the big, the, the, like the bigger problem or the bigger challenge users and customers are running into are timeouts, right? And the problem is everyone who has like looked at timeouts and worked with them and tried to figure out what's going on, the realization is timeouts are always the effect but never the cause, right? Timeouts are the symptom of something being slow in the system or taking longer than expected. And that's something that um, realization hasn't happened to lots of users out there, right? They see a timeout and they think, the problem is the timeout, right? So one, one of the steps or one of the important pieces here is to help users um, first realize that timeouts are not the real problem and they need to like go deeper and figure out what caused the timeout in the first place. But then also give them the tools um, and functionality in their hands to actually go troubleshoot. It. Because one of the, the challenges with, for example, the current Java SDK, but it's similar in, in, in other languages, is that um, here in, the, in this in the stack trace, uh, the user has been performing a GET request, so just fetching a document, right? And what, what it get returned was a timeout exception. But the problem is just with the timeout exception only tells you, well, something was slower than expected. The deadline you gave it as a timeout value, basically it took longer than this timeout, this deadline, but it didn't tell you exactly what went wrong, what, what went slower, um, and then, it's very hard to troubleshoot, right? The next step, most of the time, is go look at the logs, figure out if you can see something, go fetch information from the server to see if something's slow there and so forth, right? So a very um, iterative process, explorative process, but also sometimes very time consuming. And um, making that time, time slower to basically go from something went wrong to detecting what went wrong um, and exactly how to fix that, right, is, is, is the whole purpose of the uh, response time observability. So uh, common causes, um, obviously there are three um, players or three um, components in our distributed system, right? There is a, the app servers and there can be many of them. And then we have the network and then we have a cluster of couch based nodes. And <laughs> each of them um, can have several causes. So um, if, if you look at the application server, right? At, at the very bottom, you have the, 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 the network, networking card and then on top of that, you have the operating system with potential many different layers of virtualization, um, including Docker, Kubernetes, whatever, right? So that doesn't make it easier to troubleshoot what's going on. And we have seen weird bugs at the OS level. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to go too deep into that, but uh, we, we, had, we had issues there as well. And then obviously you have the runtime, right? So if you are if you develop um, a Java application, you have your application server, at least your JDK, garbage collection, all the fun things that um, you have to troubleshoot. And then inside your runtime, you have your application where um, something can go wrong, logic problems. And then inside the application, um, you have the SDK, which can also have bugs, right? No code is perfect. So you have all these, these causes on the application side. And then if we um, go down the, um, the, 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 the layers, um, we get to the network and then you have firewalls, switches, load balancers, proxies, all causing latencies, maybe in batches, maybe, yeah, like spontaneously we have seen firewalls dropping packets, firewalls basically um, black holing the sockets, neither telling the server nor the client that the socket got closed, right, operations going into the void, <laughs> all these uh, fun things on the network and um, with uh, shared networks on EC2 and other cloud providers, um, yeah. It's, it's even trickier. And then once we have all the application and the network handle, then we can look at the, the Couchbase server cluster. And there everything applies obviously to the OS layer, but um, then um, instead of the application server, we have our Couchbase server node where each individual service um, can cause slowness. Or um, like if you fetch a document, the disk can be slow, right? So it's coming from the KB service or um, garbage collection in the Nickel query engine. Um, something like that. So then you, you have all those causes uh, inside Couchbase. And then on top of that, we need to figure out where the slowness comes from with a single timeout exception. Um, and, then, and that led us to 
look around and, and, and figure out some ways to, to make it easier onto our users and uh, to our support folks. And this is what led us to, to open tracing. So um, we, we basically sat down and did some brainstorming and, and figured out some key uh, requirements for uh, adopting a certain API inside our languages. Um, so there is um, vendor neutrality because we are not in the business of, of uh, like application performance monitoring, right? We are not providing tracing implementations, but for us it's important that we plug in into as many um, uh, as, as many uh, tracing implementations as possible, right? We, we don't want to enforce anything specific onto our users. And then for us, it's important also that at least by default, uh, it has a small footprint. Um, we are bringing in more dependencies, which means uh, potentially there are clashes with other um, uh, application dependencies, right? The more baggage we bring into the system, the more there is a challenge that specific customers have trouble deploying it and so forth. So we're looking for a minimal footprint. Um, it needs to be supported across all our um, SDK languages that we support. Um, so I've, I've, I've put all those uh, logos here on the side, so Java, Go, .NET, C, PHP, Python, and so forth. So we, we officially maintain a large array of, of SDKs, and every functionality that we were out, we need to provide in all of those languages. So that um, if you are uh, coming from Java and you're switching over to .NET, you want to feel right at home, you want to have the same functionality. And in large diverse ecosystems in, in enterprises, right? You, you have different teams running different languages, but eventually if they settle on the same distributed tracing engine for the whole system, or you have different microservices in different languages, you want to have the same functionality available. Um, and then it's, uh, it should be actively developed, right? It shouldn't be something that uh, we adopt and that it's already no, there, there is no, uh, no adoption anymore right out there. So, um, that's why we settled on open tracing uh, because it's vendor neutral. Um, it supports all the languages that we need for SDKs. <laughs> um, it's, and, and this is very important for us, it's an API only, no other decisions are made. We don't want to enforce any <coughs> network, uh, specific uh, network transport protocol decisions onto our users. Uh, we don't want to enforce um, other implementation details that they uh, want to uh, override or customize in their system. And uh, it's, it's uh, backed by the CNCF, so um, it has certain momentum, right? There is, it's, it's not like this small one-off solution that um, users end up building um, customized uh, code anyways for it, right? So it, it, it basically brings all this, this backing with it. And it's a moving target, and uh, so that's a little challenge for us, right? Um, but the, the, the good news is we can influence the moving target, right? You can participate in open tracing and move it forward. Um, what we mean by moving target is um, the, the versions of, so it's not like a, there is a 1.0 spec that uh, is basically set in stone. It's, 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 it's evolving, which is a good thing, but it also means that we need to basically keep track of the changes and then with each uh, incremental SDK version, basically bump the dependencies of open tracing to make sure we are, we are tracking it appropriately. So one, one other key design decision was to um, implement a default tracer, right? So if, if someone upgrades, let's say from Java SDK 2.5 to 2.6, where there is open tracing support, um, the user doesn't even have to know that open tracing is in place other than getting in one more dependency. And the reason is we want to make it uh, plug and play, zero friction, right? And the idea is that we ship with a default tracer called the threshold logging tracer. And what it does is it's a tracer that is enabled by default and it aggregates slow spans um, on a per service basis. So for example, key value, nickel, all those services we provide and logs them at an interval. And we have set specific thresholds, but you can tune them. So they are set at, for example, any uh, KB operation that takes longer than 500 milliseconds. Um, they are, those are aggregated and then logged at a 10 second interval. Um, and then, um, for example, the top 10, the top 10 slowest operations are printed into the log with additional information. And with the information that we provide, it suddenly makes timeout correlation possible. So in the, um, in the, st in the, the timeout exception shown here, um, it actually changes um, from a simple timeout exception without context to uh, a timeout exception which gives you an identifier that you can use for uh, looking at the logs. Um, we, we provide operation ID, the local and remote sockets, we set the timeout. So um, we suddenly, um, enable the user to look at this information and then correlate it with 
the log output from the threshold log report, right, which is part of the tracer. So um, every 10 seconds, it will dump out uh, the top 10 or whatever you configure uh, slow operations and give you the same information. And in addition, give you the timings for specific parts of the process, right? Because let's say you have a timer at 500 milliseconds, but the operation hasn't returned. But if one second later the operation returns from the server, we can still get information out of it and then put it in your, in your log, right? So in, in this case, you can see the total time the operation took to execute. The dispatch time is in there, which basically combines the network time and the server time. Um, and then if um, the server service supports it, it also gives you the, the server, in, uh, server time in microseconds. So for example, if you store a document uh, or you retrieve it from our KV engine, as part of the response, it will tell you how long the operation took. Then we also give it information. So by looking at all those different uh, timing spans, um, suddenly you get this immediate insight into the different timings of the system without before you had this opaque timeout and you had to go figure out on your own what's going on, right? So, and as in a Java example, um, this is like the demo setup that you'll see in a bit, but I wanted to include some screenshots in here as well, right? So by accepting a tracer into our client, you can configure whatever you want, right? You can just leave, uh, use our default Couchbase uh, threshold log tracer. You can use Jaeger tracing, you can use Lightstep, you can use whatever you want. And the way you put in your tracer is just um, the, the way you do it with the Couchbase Java SDK or any other SDK in general, right? So there is this environment where you just give it a tracer instant and, and we would use it. So just by changing uh, the environment with giving it another tracer instance, um, suddenly you go from our built-in zero friction copy, copy paste uh, uh, logging engine to a distributed tracing engine without for you having to do anything, right? So for example, here is an, uh, a screenshot I took from, from Jaeger where we are performing an operation called get from replica where we are um, uh, basically you're asking for give me the, the document from the active node and all the replicas. Right? And you can see how the uh, parent get from replica operation then has subspans of the get going to the active node. And then here I have one replica configured. So the operation, um, you can also see how it goes to the rep, basically the, the active and the replica at the same time. You can see how long it took. And then you can see all the, the spans basically that previously in the log tracer were just fields in the JSON. You can see them as actual spans here how long the, took the dispatch to the server, how long took the response decoding and so forth. That's just out of the box in the system. And then uh, another quick example, here's a nickel query where um, you, you can see we are also adding tags to our spans. So you get the component, you get the service that you're running, uh, you get the, the statement that got executed, specific operations ID and so forth. So basically storing all the tags um, along the way which you can use for filtering and further troubleshooting. So with that, um, let me um, jump into a quick demo so you can see uh, the whole thing um, working. Or maybe, uh, uh, are there any questions so far? Okay, then I'll just uh, move on. This is awesome though. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. So, um, so you, you, you like the demo. Um, so I have a, a, just a Couchbase node running locally. So this is our UI, there is nothing fancy. We have two buckets. One is our travel sample bucket, which has um, airports, airlines. It's just some sample data that you can use for querying. Um, and we'll, we'll use it. And then I have a Yiga instance running locally. Um, and I'll, I'll show you how that works. So um, here we have our code. Um, can you, let me, let me just show it to you briefly and then we run it. <laughs> so, as a first step, um, uh, as a first step, we'll do the Couchbase tracing and then the Yiga tracing. So um, other than that, uh, we connect to localhost, give it our uh, credentials, open our bucket, and then we perform a document fetch. And then we will replace the document we just fetched, and then we'll run a nickel query, select distinct type from travel sample. So it will give us all the, the distinct types that are in the bucket. And then we just sleep a little bit, so we give the, the, both the, the Couchbase and the Giga Traces some chance to, to send it to the remote system. Um, and the way we, we set 
things up uh, for the couch base tracer. I've been modifying the report a little bit. So I've been lowering the threshold um, to one microsecond to make sure that every operation actually gets logged and I increase the sample size from top 10 to top 100. You don't need to do that, but um, you, you can see how to configure it. Also setting it pretty to true. Um, you only would do that in debug, obviously, because in, in a production system, you want to keep your logs uh, short. But we lock it in JSON, so if you run something that is taking a log file and putting them to another system, for example, if you don't have a distributed uh, tracing engine that right now, you can still make use of the, the JSON blob and feed it into another system to analyze later, or for our support staff who can just grab for the stuff and, and look at look at things that are slow. Or we configure the Jaeger tracer, we point it to localhost, give it some params, right? So, but but pretty pretty simple setup. Um, and let's run this first. Uh, let me yeah. I'll just run this with uh, the Couchbase logger. And what you can see here is that, so we were doing three operations. Let me just, don't know. Ah, uh, yeah, I can make it bigger. Okay, so that's just, all right. So what you can see is uh, we've, we've been performing those three operations, again, the replace and the nickel query, and they all show up here uh, in, our, in our log, right? So we have the get request, and this identifier, uh, it, 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 it's um, maybe not as important to you right now, but what this thing does actually, what we do with, uh, once we connect to the server during the, the handshake process, we pass this ID um, to uh, the server, so the server also has a, like a threshold log of some sorts and it will lock this ID as well. So you can take with this ID um, and the, the operation ID, you can uniquely identify any operation in the system on the server side, right? So even if you, if you do not feed this into some distributed tracing engine, you still get the chance to have a better correlation of what's, what's slow in the system. And we, we see the timing, right? So 20 millis, decode took uh, 9.7 millis, so you get all of this out of the box. Fetching the document on the server, excluding network time, um, took 49 microseconds. Then we have the replace operation, and we have the nickel operation. And if we do the same thing um, with the Giga Tracer, right again. So you can actually, in the UI, uh, on our Couchbase UI, you can see the, uh, so you can see the, in the bucket statistics, you can see the operations going through. And then if we go over here, find the traces, you, you see those spines in Jaeger, right? Without doing anything. Clicking on the nickel span, you can see the dispatch to server time. Um, on the nickel, you have all the tags, right? The, the query just executed. The operation ID, um, all, all, everything basically you've seen in the logging tracer also gets uh, stored here in Jaeger. And uh, we can look at the others like the place. And the other thing is that depending on what kind of operation you run, if it's a mutation, uh, we will uh, span the uh, encoding part. If it's a fetch operation, we will span the decoding part uh, because we've seen in the past that like, if you have huge documents, um, JSON encoding and decoding can take a long time, right? So you would immediately see that as well here. Um, all those things are, are in place. So I think I'm, 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 I'm pretty good on my 25 to 30 minutes. Uh, oh, I, oh one, one more thing. Ah, I forgot, I forgot. I forgot the call to action before we go into questions. So um, our uh, open tracing support is currently in the developer preview. We are planning on a beta end of next week, uh, two weeks from now. And then once Couchbase server 5.5 ships um, in a couple weeks, months, uh, something like that, this thing will become GA, right? So our call to action right now is we're actively looking for feedback in all kinds of languages. Um, it doesn't matter if you are uh, doing Java, .NET, whatever. I uh, would really like your feedback on our implementation, on API, what we can do better. Um, our response time observability, so we have a concept called SDK RFCs. 
So every feature we develop for our, for our SDKs, I would basically put in an RFC where we discuss it. And these are open, uh, open access. So I put the, the link in here for the draft. Uh, take a look, uh, put in questions and, and remarks if you have them. Um, and the other thing I wanted to point out is, so we have a blog at blog, blog.couchbase.com. We're currently working on a series of blog posts um, on, on that topic. Um, so watch that space. Uh, there is more to come, um, come there. If you watch that uh, in the future, um, you can go there right now since they will be published. <laughs> Uh, with that, uh, thank you very much for um, uh, spending the time with me, 25, 30 minutes, uh, and thanks for the opportunity to um, let us uh, show what we've been doing for the last couple of months. And with that, I'll open it up for questions. Um, please, Mike, Matt, Graham, since you're on the call, if there are any other questions uh, that affect you, please jump in. Thank you. An awesome talk. Uh, Thanks so much. I do have uh, one quick question. So, well, comment first. I guess I just said this is awesome, but this is awesome. It's really exciting to see this. And it reminds me a lot of um, uh, Big Table. Google had a pretty thick clients that did a lot of important logic that was involved in the same sorts of optimizations you're doing. And I, I recall that uh, that tracing in those clients was essential for the same reasons that you've outlined. I was curious, though, um, from kind of a business standpoint, uh, for Couchbase or for the people using Couchbase, the, um, how, how important are these sorts of timeouts in terms of the support team and so on? Is this like pain point number one or is this like, where is this on the list? So from um, basically working with support team, I can tell you that in general timeouts are maybe one or two on the list. So it's, it's a very big pain point. And the reason is that one, one of the reasons I didn't mention is that, um, for example, especially on our KV operations, we have a default timeout of two and a half seconds, right? And some users even set it even lower. And if you compare it to traditional databases where you have 70, 75, or even no timeout, very quickly you run into those timeouts, right? Where in other systems, the thread will just <coughs> you have to go look at the profiler and see that your threads are blocked people are running into timeouts with Couchbase way more often just because our timeouts are lower by default, which in my opinion is the right decision, right? Because it, it's this escape ledge where if something gets slow, you then you can retry, you can do whatever you want and we give you back the control. But the average user who is not used to like handling timeouts, especially combined with um, asynchronous operations, so the Java SDK is asynchronous as well, right? So handling asynchronous retries and so forth, you all need it for running a scalable distributed system, but it's just not something that the average developer is like immediately used to, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, the other, uh, just to mention a couple of quick things. One of the challenges I guess we have at, at Couchbase is we are Apache 2 open source and, and there's there's a, an enterprise subscription, all that stuff. So we certainly have those, those commercial customers, but then we also have lots of two and three node deployments. Uh, so in those cases, I don't need, you know, sometimes this becomes an issue for them, but they're not always running that, that kind of full tilt. Others like LinkedIn, they have, uh, you know, they're public reference first and they have like 1200 nodes of catch base. Um, and they obviously want their site fast. And so uh, get that, getting that observability is really important to them. And, and just to clarify, part of the, the value prop here is not just that, you've given instrumentation to your customers, but you also, you wrote this instrumentation with some playbooks in mind, right? So you actually have some playbooks you're gonna be giving your customer or otherwise when they come to support, you know, uh, it's integrated with the kind of hooks you've, and trace points you put into the client. Yeah, right? absolutely. Uh, one, I don't think I can reference who they are, but one user is actually a member of um, CNCF and Open Tracing. Uh, and they're probably going to implement, they have some specific needs and they'll probably do their own tracer. And then of course, there are gonna be plenty of um, you know, both, both commercial project, commercial products and projects that people can plug in. Yeah, um, my, my one comment on that is, you know, there's been a discussion about like automated tracing versus manual tracing, um, which I think is like maybe the wrong way to slice it. And I would like to maybe go forward to talk about there's two kinds of automated tracing 
there's dynamic tracing, which is the traditional agent-based thing. And then there's, there's pre-provided tracing from the, the service provider, right? And they're, they're kind of mutually exclusive, right? Because the point of this instrumentation is the service provider has given you this because they have like playbooks about what you're supposed to, to do when these things pop off. Um, and, and that's and like... Other, you know, that, uh, as you said, Brandon, and the other thing is that with like as a, we as a service provider, we just know from history where the pain points are, right? So we can provide very narrow and focused instrumentation on the usual pain points. With If you have some generic tracing, agent-based, right? You're basically, you don't have this insight because you just can't learn every library out there 100% and right, how the usage patterns are and so forth. Yeah, I would love us to start explaining this to people about how these are both useful things, but they're just useful for, for solving kind of mutually exclusive problems. Yeah, and, and what we have here is pretty modest. Um, you know, it, it, doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't do a whole lot, but at the same time it does, uh, it, it gives you, um, you know, a fair amount of insight very easily, which was kind of our goal. And we had to, uh, Mike, Mike Goldsmith in particular, he and I had to spend a lot of time thinking about like, okay, how do we make sure that we can run this out of the box, not spam the log, still get useful information out of the comic concept. That's awesome. So uh, is this uh, currently uh, done only on the clients or do you have also backend instrumentations? At the moment, uh, oops, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. At the moment, uh, it's, it's uh, only on the client, however, uh, we do, um, and Michael showed this a little bit, we do actually grab um, uh, certain statistics that are returned in the responses and then put those in. Uh, so that was one of the um, kind of important things that we had uh, actually is that you know, frequently when we'll see these things, people will wonder, you know, we, we've seen uh, the one issue Michael kind of slightly referenced, we, we saw an issue where um, it, was, it was SSD wear leveling and it would affect uh, nodes fairly randomly, but how do you find it? Uh, because it would be intermittent. And so we needed to be able to see that, that server side uh, measure of how long it took. The other thing that we did here is um, there's a correlation ID so that you can take uh, the correlation ID and then go look at uh, other information on, on the server side from a, a logging perspective. That, that, that's maybe a little less distributed than we'd like, but uh, it's there out of the box. Um, in the future, we're hoping to, to carry it further. Yeah, I mean, I think important to point out is right. This is not like the end for couch based, but this is a first step, and we have more plans, right, to integrate it potentially with the server, have even more instrumentation, right. But this is like the, the first step in, in, into this uh, adventure. <laughs> yeah, and we didn't really show it, but it's also important to us is that the user can do their own instrumentation and have that pass along into our libraries, right. Uh, so Michael shown that in some of the other demos. Yeah, I wanted to mention that too. I've seen uh, there's a few other databases that have open tracing instrumentation, and and I think when they get plugged into applications, uh, application code that also has open tracing, being able to see that full stack has been quite powerful for those end users. Okay, so we've got 20 minutes left on the call. <clears throat> and maybe a couple other things to get through, but uh, this has been a great talk. Uh, are there any final questions uh, to ask the Couchbase team before we move on? All right. Well, we can certainly continue this conversation in Gitter, uh, and this video will get posted up on the internet so we can start sharing it around, because I thought that was a great presentation, personally. Um, but uh, moving on, uh, someone put update about happenings in the larger tracing community. Um, I think I put that down. It's my fault. Yes, you, yeah. Did you um, have something specific there? Uh, maybe. I mean, I might consolidate it with the uh, item uh, a few uh, a few lines down around the uh, the conversation that we had on Tuesday. Uh, it's. I just. I think since the last OTSD call, there was. Um, a Gartner report that came out uh, about microservices and APM, which ended up basically saying that the enterprise software market that Gartner studies is moving towards uh, increased adoption of, of explicit white box instrumentation. 
and then mentioned open tracing by name a couple of times, which is which is cool to see, and I think reflected reality. Uh, that uh, was met with like a number of blog posts from um, other folks, some of w which had varying levels of of positivity about about open tracing and uh, instrumentation in general. Um, that that was not uh, causally related to a blog post that Erica uh, Arnold from the OTSC uh, put up. Uh, a few weeks ago, um, but it's topically related to that, which just kind of described the different aspects of tracing, which is something I think Ted put on the agenda. But in general, there seems to be um, a growing need to, like, within the larger tracing community, to describe the different aspects of tracing and name them and specify which problem is which problem and make sure that, that people who are trying to solve problem A value that problem B and problem C and problem D are still important. Um, so I think that's the basic narrative that, um, that I would try to play about this whole thing. Uh, there's certainly other takes on it that would be a little bit more um, emotionally driven, but in general, I, I think of this as like a lot of people who need to understand um, the value of different problems. Uh, to that end, there was actually a very productive meeting on Tuesday that was organized by Alui uh, Wright, Archer, sorry, I'm gonna mess up his last name, um, from Dynatrace and he uh, got a bunch of folks together, who many of whom had been working on the W3C um, uh, context propagation standards effort, and uh, and and tried to start a conversation, including uh, representatives from uh, New Relic and AppDynamics, um, as, as well as Census and um, Sergey from Microsoft, around the importance of um, of white box instrumentation without naming open tracing by name or open census by name and uh, that it was a useful useful conversation for sure i think we all i, th I think everyone agreed that it was very important for there to be uh, a stand well uh, a lowercase s standard api for describing transactions that was separate from anything else which is open tracing's charter and then um, app dynamics and dynatrace and to a certain extent new relic but maybe to a lesser extent new relic um, have certain things they'd like to um, to express at different levels of, of uh, application complexity, like they'd like to separate span management from higher level concerns like describing HTTP requests and database calls and things like that. So we had a, about a day long workshop to talk about how a lot of that would work and I felt like it was quite productive and there's a lot of alignment. So um, I just wanted to say that we're gonna continue to have that conversation. If people are interested, you should ping me uh, or Ted or whomever. and, and all are certainly welcome to participate in it, uh, but I just wanted to let people know that that's happening. I, I don't like how they feel like there are several different small conversations going on with people from different continents about tracing, and I wish that everyone could just be in one conversation. So this is just my attempt to update that that other conversation is happening and, and to welcome anyone who wants to take part in it. But, um, but in general, I thought it was very positive and there's a lot of alignment. Yeah, yeah, I would second that and say um, that conversation kind of dovetails with the W3C working group uh, that is mostly uh, focused on this trace context wire protocol. That wire protocol conversation is important. It hasn't been super directly related to open tracing in the sense that we're wire protocol agnostic, but it is important to obviously the members of the open tracing community where these two things start to get tied together more closely is on the other side with a sort of data export format. If you're gonna use a standard wire protocol to tie multiple tracing uh, systems together uh, with you know, uh, unified correlation IDs across tracing systems, you're still gonna to have to have this problem where you have to get the data out of one of these two tracing systems into the other one so that you can analyze it. Uh, so a standardized data format um, is sort of the other half of that puzzle. And once you're defining the data format, you're getting to something that relates much more deeply to the kind of instrumentation you're doing. The uh, model of that format ideally should line up with the model that the API is thinking about. And then more concretely, the you know tags and keys and values that the data format is using to describe things like HTTP calls or any other higher level concept really needs to match what that instrumentation library is doing. So I think that's an area where that W3C tracing working group and open tracing 
uh, those projects need to to gel up on that side um, because there is a lot of overlap there. Um, other people were at that meeting. Uh, if people want to keep talking about that, uh, uh, please uh, go ahead. Otherwise, uh, we'll move on. When's the next one? I don't know, Chris. When is it? Well, you can all come to Providence, Rhode Island. Sweet. All right. Chris is organizing the next one in Providence. So ask him when it's going to happen. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, as soon as uh, another one does get on the books, uh, uh, we will make sure to spread it around the open tracing community. Um, so other happenings, um, going down the, the list on the agenda, there was an inaugural Austin meetup. This is awesome. I believe this is the first official whatever uh, open tracing meetup uh, that has occurred, at least in the US, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, there was a meetup group in Austin uh, that was uh, formed uh, mostly uh, people at, I believe, uh, a home away and Under Armour kind of um, holding it down. Uh, sorry if, if uh, I left someone out there. Um, it consisted of a number of talks. Uh, I gave a talk. Um, Eduardo from Homeway gave a talk and there was a, a panel of uh, tracing. It wasn't all open tracing uh, related, but there were people who worked on the Haystack system at Expedia, uh, as well as uh, people from PayPal, uh, who has had a centralized log aggregator for a while. It's like a tracing system. Um, and so there was a panel discussion on tracing and the pros and cons. Um, my big takeaway was that this is really useful to people. <laughs> uh, application developers don't like instrumenting the third party software uh, that they're given. They don't like doing it themselves. They would prefer that it come with something out of the box, like what Couchbase uh, has created, uh, that they can just plug into. Um, and if it's a third party plugin, that's great. If it's first party and comes with a playbook, uh, and information, deeper information about what, you know, those trace points are trying to measure, that's, that's way better for them. So it was interesting to see users on one end asking for this and then uh, hearing like this couch based presentation around service providers, uh, giving them the thing that they're asking for. So uh, that's making me feel really happy. Basically, it was a great meetup. And we should uh, perhaps start more in some of these other towns uh, that we're clustered in. So anyone who wants to start and run an open tracing meetup, uh, I'd recommend doing it and uh, uh, just ping me, uh, me and Priyanka, if you want some help with that. I'll take you up on that. We'd be uh, glad to maybe do something in South Bay, in the Bay Area. Awesome, yeah, the South Bay meetup would be great. Okie dokie. Uh, we've got 10 minutes left. Uh, we've gone through basically everything. Someone put tracing in four parts, talk summary from Ted. Uh, so I guess I will talk briefly about that. Uh, we've already, I think, covered this. Um, Erica wrote a great post called, you know, um, tracing, tracing, tracing. And uh, I gave a talk along a similar topic uh, down in Austin that I would like to turn into a blog post. Um, but pointing out the way I think people have been receiving it well is like there's four parts of tracing. I, I put a link to the particular slide. I think that shows this. Uh, you've got a tracing API that you're using uh, to instrument your code. There's a wire protocol that's standardized to talk between these systems. There's a, a data protocol um, that's uh, sending things uh, between analysis systems and then there's an analysis system itself so talking about it in those terms the api the wire protocol the data protocol and the analysis system is a nice way to break it down because different people are focused on those different components so depending on 
your role in this cloud ecosystem, you might find one of these things way more useful than the other. Uh, for example, if you work on cloud infrastructure at Google or Amazon, and you're providing black box services to people, um, you really care about this wire protocol and this data protocol, because there's no way for them to install, you know, a Jaeger tracing client in S3 for you, if that's what you're using. Um, so the API layer is like not very useful to people uh, who come from that background. And because internally at places like Google, they tend to write all the software from scratch in house, something like, you know, an agnostic API isn't useful for them internally either too much. Um, so people from that background tend to really, really focus on these protocol level things. Uh, whereas people who are not currently yet trying to glue together multiple tracing systems, uh, are less likely to look at this wire protocol and data protocol stuff and be like, that's my big pain point. Without a standard data protocol, how am I supposed to get my information out of Jaeger? And the answer is like, well, I don't know. I just put it all in Jaeger and there it is. So it's fine. So there is a bit of people in the community, I think, sometimes talking past each other because they're just feeling a different part of the elephant. And I would like to get that sort of like cleared up, maybe as like, getting some common language around that stuff. So on that front, I'm gonna to try to turn this into a, a blog post uh, to kind of follow up with what Erica wrote. So I don't think we can say this enough. And uh, that's all I have to say on that subject. Look for the blog post. Okay. So we've got um, a couple minutes left and uh, we've actually made it all the way through the agenda. Uh, does anyone have any announcements? They I, think would Chris, I think Chris added something to the agenda. Possibly. Oh, you did? I just, I just added an item because last week or last night meeting uh, month, there was the action item that I was gonna change my uh, PR to do trace context header detection on basic tracer for Go to have a start with a, a, a a first step suggested by Yuri that the inbound trace ID in the trace context header would be stored as a correlation, but not used for the basic tracer zone trace. And then the second phase could be a separate PR that actually upgraded basic tracer to 128 bit. Um, so I, I'm also going to those W3C meetings and I wanted to have something to show for both of this group and that group. and. You know, how it, well, so I guess I should just put this on the getter, but what, what do you think is the method of correlating a, base, a W3C trace context trace ID with uh, uh, a, an open tracing, basic tracer trace ID? Like, is it just a tag with the name trace context and that's it? Or do you want to do anything fancier than that? What, what, what does it mean to have base, basic compliance, you know, for, for basic tracers? Basic tracers, you know, has probably it's doesn't reference. deserve to be in the, it probably should be in contrib or something, you know, like I, I think yeah. that, like, uh, you know, it's more of a reference implementation exactly. than, than like something anyone is really depending on in a meaningful way that I'm aware of. Oh, yeah. Right. And this was just intended to be a reference implementation of how you might parse the trace context header and use it for your own tracing. Yeah. Um, it's a good question. Uh, so, so your proposal is to parse it and then add it as a tag to the basic tracer span, but not to change the, the main propagation format? Yeah, I got the impression that's what Yuri was suggesting last month when he said, well, why don't you start out with just, um, it's in the notes from last month. And I said, yeah, okay, I could split it up. But because I had gone into a more deeper integration where I was just going to change basic tracer to do 128-bit trace IDs because it's doing 60 bit oh, yeah. trace IDs. And yeah. then just, you know, trust native naively the sampling bit and the, everything else. It's kind of a, uh, you know, a punt, but another thing, I, I'm not attached to this at all, but I could imagine basic tracers options that it uses at startup time could include some kind of designation as to which propagation format it's intended to use. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that XOT span context thing, which was added as sort of like a, just a, on a whim, I think is, actually caused people a lot of anger, which is hilarious to me. It's just like, it's like we have to choose something. It's a reference implementation. Um, but replacing that, or at least having the option to replace that with the W3C thing, 
would be completely fine as far as I personally am concerned, although obviously there are other people who might care about it, but, but then there could just be a, like a construction time option to initialization yeah. time option to basic tracer to say, hey, like use the W3C thing as your propagation format. And personally, I think that would be fine. But again, I, I don't know if Yuri had something else in mind and I don't, I don't mean to dictate it. No, yeah, that's like not that. fine. But okay. is part, part of what you were trying to explore, Chris, was just what if people are in this situation, right? Like it was uh, Yeah, like I have a tracer that uses a wacky um, trace ID, but it's also a open tracing compatible. Uh, and also just um, there exists no actual implementation of the Duzuchi standard on, on, the, on the internet that I'm aware of. So that was the yeah. other reason for doing a reference. Yeah. There's, a, there's like a half implemented version in census but it doesn't actually match the current spec or get yeah the so time. chris like for light stuff we've had we've made some changes to our own internal format which is not no one is claiming to be any kind of standard and when we've done that we've basically had you know uh an if else you know yeah thing where we attempt to parse different formats and that would be another option to make basic tracer prefer the w3c format and if it's unavailable to fall back on the XIT span context thing or whatever, I mean, that, that is a, another option. Yeah, I think the original, yeah, okay. I think I'll try that then, because that's easier, certainly, than doing it with the weird. Um, I think the original idea was, oh, let's say you go through, um, I don't know, from Dynatrace to X-Ray and back again, and you want to see the trace ID that X-Ray put on the thing, assuming everyone's using W3 trace context, and that's, implementation would have like a good example of how that might work that scenario that's a lot more complicated than what what but that was the idea of i think the reference implementation the demonstration. I, think, I think it's a great idea and I, I i think that approach would would i mean that that scenario you just outlined is sort of the you know the graduate course level version maybe we're talking about the high school level version or whatever just yeah. like part of yeah. that's what i want to eventually show is like here's how you could actually um have a two different tracing systems with two different trace IDs to sort of interoperate. I still think you will need some sort of like a correlation uh, ID tag because yeah, right. even, uh, um, I mean, even if the tracer supports like W3C fully, sometimes you, you want to give the user the option to either participate in the trace or only connect to the trace, right? Right, um, yeah, that's agreed. And that's, that's sort of how the Dynatrace Amazon, you know, sort of, thing would work, you wouldn't just trust other um, tracers or even use their ID. You would just <laughs> add it as a correlation and then push it into the magic um, correlation context header. Well, All right. and I, I certainly think there's value in just the simpler task of, of just trying to parse that header, <laughs> like try to actually implement that standard. Uh, this is getting into W3C business, but my one concern on that front is there's been lots and lots of talk about optimization. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like in some sense, some of that talk has been focused too much on like the kind of optimization you would get out of building your own custom HTTP client that was like super optimized for, for grabbing these things. Uh, because again, I think infrastructure developers will do that because it's worth it to them. But I have wondered, like, what are the actual uh, performance impl implications for everybody else who are going to use this uh, around, like, you know, uh, first you parse the headers and then you got to go into this, like, trace context header and then parse that thing, right? Like, multiple rounds of parsing there versus uh, separate headers. Like, some of those optimization debates have felt a little <clears throat> without anyone like plugging this into spring and other real systems out there and seeing like what what actually happens yeah yeah no i just want there to be code that mirrors the spec that they're writing over there so that people can look at it and talk about it instead of just writing stuff awesome okay cool see you then great okay i think we're at the end of our hour um this was a great call thanks again to the couchbase people for giving that awesome presentation um and uh, uh i would encourage open tracing people to follow up with some of this w3c work 
uh, and start getting more involved in that group because they're starting to gel up a bit. Thanks to you guys for putting the stuff together. We, we, we do, you know, we want to work with you and, uh, and no reason we can't, we can't, you know, work together on building some awesome house. Thanks. Excited. Thanks. Excited for the next open tracing meetup group. Yeah. Cool. See you later. All right. Bye. Ciao.